Let's turn to Jude, uh, verses 3 to 7. <clears throat> Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains under, the, under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going off to strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Let us pray. Bless us, O Father, through thy blessed Spirit, that we might have understanding of your word that Jesus Christ and his truth may dwell in our hearts continually with all its glory. O oh, Father, we pray that we will be contenders of the faith. We will not be easily fooled and ensnared by the evil one. Bless us with understanding of thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the first two verses of this epistle, we learn that we are sanctified, preserved, called, and blessed. Every Christian is blessed with mercy, peace, and love. It is God's pleasure to bless His people. And He blesses us with His richest spiritual blessing. In Ephesians 1.3, Paul said, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Not one of you who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ can say, I'm not so blessed. I'm not so blessed. No, all of us are, are blessed with all spiritual blessings. And so we must be always expectant of his blessing. You see, spiritual blessings are not counted in terms of money or bank balance or the bigness of the house you live or the luxury of the car you drive. These things do not measure the blessings of God because the wicked ones also drive luxurious cars. They also live in big houses. That does improve their spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings far exceed material things. Material things are not a measure of spiritual blessings. God's mercy, peace, and love cannot be purchased with money. Money is not a proof of such things either. So we must remember, we are talking about Things that are not seen with naked eyes. And at a real spiritual experience of those who are God's children. So we cannot mix spiritual reality with physical realities and count physical realities for spiritual realities. That would be a great mistake. Unfortunately, this is the kind of gospel preaching we have today. Namely, health, wealth, gospel. 
They think of God's blessing purely as money and health. Whereas we count them even far exceeding those things. We are happy to say good riddance to the things of this world. As Martin Luther taught us to sing, sing let kindreds, let goods and kindreds go. We are happy to say for the sake of Christ. We are willing to sacrifice anything for Christ because nothing in this world can match the blessings that Christ offers. I'm glad to be a preacher in this matter. I'm glad to have all things gone from my hand. I have surrendered all to Jesus because the blessings that Christ has for me far exceeds the wealth of this world. I want to say something. It is far better to be a Sunday school teacher to impart the spiritual values, even the knowledge of Christ, than being a world-renowned professor of chemistry. Or any other scientific discipline. It's far better, far better, to be recipients of God's blessings than being the wealthiest man. Some people have this idea that, oh, you know how good it is. Like one young doctor once told me, you know, Pastor Koshi, I pity you, but I have great respect for Dr. S. H. To, who is the pastor of Pandan. I said, why? You are such a poor man. You are a good pastor, but a poor man. He is a good pastor and a rich man. And that's best choice. Uh, I said, well, God, we praise that God has given him wealth, but that does not prove that I am less blessed. Do you know I am as satisfied as he is? I am full of peace as he is. Wealth does not take, lack of wealth does not prove I lack anything in spiritual life. I am complete in Christ. I am complete in Christ. And that's a wonderful doctrine we believe. So rejoice in our sanctified, preserved, called and blessed state. Now, this is the reason why verse 3 begins this way. Beloved. Now that is an affectionate address of Christians. There are two reasons why I believe Jude called his readers beloved. First of all, they are a people loved by God. Just as we said, we read a while ago, love be multiplied. They were loved by God, so they are beloved of God. You know, I should be seeing you as God's beloved. And I should be calling you beloved. It must be my, it is my privilege to call you beloved. To remind you of God's infinite love for you. The world may hate you. But when we come to church within the boundaries or the confinements or the fold of the church, we act as God's beloved. You know, this communion, this fellowship we have is such a sweet thing. Nothing of the world's hatred ever creep in here by God's grace. I pray that no worldly person is here to disturb this, this wonderful fellowship. This is where we enjoy the love of God for each one of us. And we share that love that God has manifested toward each of us with one another. And in this, our fellowship is complete. In this, our joy is made full. Beloved! And Jude says that as a pastoral affection as well. As a pastor, I must remember that I have no power to love you if I were to love you, I must see that God loves you too. And I must not say anything in such a way that I will make you think that God doesn't love you. I shouldn't minister in any way that would make you think that, you know, God would not care for you. Every word that I utter, every message I preach, every, um, every attitude, every action that... I have before you must remind you that God loves you. That's my calling. It is not in words. It's not about the choice of words. 
We hope our choice of words would reflect the truth. But it is the essence of what this word says. Every pastor must love, every preacher must love God's flock. Just as God has loved the church. I cannot be a hindrance to God's love for you. But I must be a promoter. Or rather, uh, one who calls you to the, to the love of God. One who makes you aware of the love of God for you. And that's not only a pastor's duty, but our mutual duty as well. Your duty to hurt me and to those who are next to you is to rem remind them of God's love. So everything you say, to even in the families, Christian families that we have, husband's duty is to remind the wife of God's love. Uh, the wife's duty is to remind the husband of God's love. And so between the parents and children. Beloved, loved by God and therefore chosen to love. But let me bring a word of caution at this time. There are those who cre creep into the church pretending to be loving and concerned. But evil in their motif. Not all those who appear to be loving are godly people. Now all those who appear to love are sent by God. Some of them are servants of the devil. They appear to be loving, but only to devour you in time to come. Apostle Jude is really concerned about the steadfastness of the church for God's truth. Because men of such counterfeit love would enter the church and would lead the people away from the truth into falsehood. So Jude's genuine love for them sought to eliminate that which lack in their watchfulness and steadfastness. And this is what we hope to achieve in this camp by God's grace. We want to make everyone who is in this camp aware of his alertness and even steadfastness to discern and to avoid the counterfeit love that would deceive us and seduce us into demonic doctrines and practices. We must stand by the truth of God's love or the truth that God's love has revealed to us in His Word. We don't want any smiling man to come around and cast doubt of the it concerning the eternal truth. We do not want any smiling, charming personality to tell us that the truth of God's word is not what we should be concerned about, but the culture, the unity, harmony of the world. Here Jude lovingly exhorts Christians to rise up, to defend their faith against the vicious enemies who have crept into the church with a smiling face. And then he tells us how urgent is this duty to contend for the faith. This is how he says in verse 3, When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you about contending, earnestly contending. Now, in these words, you see the urgency behind the exhortation to contend earnestly for the faith. Jude was making every effort to write to them concerning common salvation. By the way, every F, uh, give all diligence or diligence comes from the Greek word spude, which means 
speed or haste. It also depicts uh, uh, urgency and zeal and earnestness. Now, Apostle Paul wanted to hasten with all earnestness to talk to the recipients of this letter about the common salvation, the salvation that is commonly given or generally received by God's people. He wanted to write about the doctrine of salvation, in other words. He wanted to talk about the fact that the salvation is of the Lord and so on. We are not told about the details. Nonetheless, we just generally understand here, he wanted, first of all, to write to them in detail about the salvation. Now, he refers to salvation as common salvation. Uh, this is a reference to the fact that salvation blessings are common to all who believe. You know, Pastor Koshi doesn't have more salvation than you. Apostle Paul didn't have a greater salvation than you and I have. We all have the same salvation in Christ, which is salvation to the full measure. We are all saved to the uttermost. We are all saved to be snatched up from this evil world to the heavenly city. And no one who is saved will be abandoned. He will keep them to the end. We are preserved. So we all have the same salvation. So you and I must love this salvation just as the apostles did. Just as Jude did. Just as the early Christians did. We must be willing even to give our life for this gospel of salvation. Because to live is to Christ and to die is gain. Death also cannot snatch away this great salvation. So if the apostles gave their life to this gospel of salvation, we must be willing to give the same. Because just as much as they have found it to be an eternal blessing, we also see it as an eternal blessing. Get some of the PP church must learn something here. Nothing is too big in, the sacrifice, in sacrificing for the extension of the gospel kingdom. We must remember that. If there are rich people in our midst who would sell everything and give to the work of the gospel, it is not too big a sacrifice. If there are so many testimonies for us to read, in the history of the church. How men and women given their life. How they have given up their uh, very marvelous career in life. To embrace the humble servitude of Jesus Christ. Because of the glory that is awaiting them. We must also pursue that common understanding of salvation. We should never think of the gospel of Jesus Christ in small ways. If it has been glorious in the eyes of Jude, James, Peter, and Apostle Paul, then it should be the same in our eyes too. If our children would give up their career in medicine or engineering or in some other profession and say to us, Dad, Mom, I'm going to preach the gospel of salvation. We must rise up and our seat, sing hallelujah. And don't sit there and cry, are you? No, that's not the kind of salvation we have. That's not the kind of salvation that Jude talks about. What was common to the apostles it's also common to all those who are saved. It's a rich experience. It's a magnificent truth. And he wanted to write more and more about it. But something came into his mind. He wanted to write the fact that we are all equally saved. None is more saved or less saved. But suddenly it appears to him that he need to give attention to a very 
significant issue. And he says it in this way, It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you to contend for the faith. It was needful for me to write unto you. So though he was thinking of writing about common salvation, it became needful. And the word needful as the idea of a compelling force, something that calls for immediate attention with all gravity of mind. So he was constrained and therefore he was willing and ready to stand in the breach and do whatever necessary to defend the faith against the attack of the enemy. He realized there was an attack on the faith. Now we will talk about it soon. So he decided to write an exhort, which comes from the word parakaleo. Exhort means come alongside. He wanted these words to be like a third next to you. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that, you know, I will speak to you with the same passion with which Jude wrote it down here. I want to come along you, along you, come aside, beside you, and just sit next to you as a friend, talk with you, I want to talk with you. Because that's the intention of this, to exhort you, to stir you up. Not allowing you to be ignorant or negligent. Wake you up right now. That's why he wrote. May every preacher, every servant of the Lord serve this way. With that urgency, with that necessity. Necessity is laid upon me, that's what Paul said. And Jude picked up the pen to write with such passion. He wanted them to be challenged to take a stand for the faith. And he wanted to pass on that compulsion that he felt in his heart to them. You can never be a good preacher. You can never be a Sunday school teacher of great effectiveness unless you feel that urgency in your own heart. The best preachers, the best teachers in God's church are those who feel the pulse of God's moving spirit in their heart. And then they echo it to the people. If somebody is coming up here to show himself to be a great preacher, he will fail in the work of God. If somebody comes to the pulpit or take the stand before the children to teach them with this great awareness, the Lord wants me to communicate it in the best and accurate way. He will do it well. We are spokesmen for God when we preach the word. And we do it with passion, with zeal, with urgency, because the necessity is laid upon our heart. Paul said to the Ephesian believers in Acts 20:31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. Look at that. Remind us for three years, day and night. Some of us would like to say I've been a pastor for so many years. But it's good to ask how many days have been wasted in those years without doing the work as we ought to do. Most pastors are concerned about sabbatical leave and free time and off day. And so many people have scolded me for not having an off day for 20 years. They think I am a problem because if I keep saying there's no need off day, every day is a day of the Lord must work hard, then they can't take off day. So they thought I'm a problem. 
And some have chided me very strongly about it. I'm not against the off day. If you want to take an off day, off day. The Lord Jesus also rested. If you need to have rest, rest. But we cannot sort of say, Oh, look, I rather prefer to rest even if there is a work to do. There must be a sense of urgency. There must be a readiness to get along others to do the work of the Lord. Our rest is coming. We shall rest from all labor. Now is the day to work. The night is coming when no man can work. We must hurry ourselves. We must find our strength in the presence of God. By lying on the bed, we will not have extra strength to preach tomorrow. It is in our communion with the Lord, in the meditation of God's word, in, the, in prayer, that we find our strength. Yes, physical rest has its place. Don't get me wrong, please. Don't go and scold your pastor if he's tired and sleeping. But, but no pastor should think, more sleep will make me a better pastor. Or more rest will make me a better pastor. That's wrong. If that's the case, Jesus made lots of mistakes. Praying through the night without sleeping. Walking through the night to preach next morning. Paul might have made a lot of mistakes as well. But they all worked. Day and night. And they slept when the Lord wanted them to sleep. But our greatest concern is to pass on the urgency that God has given to us in declaring the truth and defending the truth at all cost. And no one should think our life is more important than doing this work. And God's in a baby church. Nobody in our church should ever think you are more precious than the truth of gospel if you think that's the case you are in the wrong place you are listening to the wrong preacher my duty is not to comfort anybody to sit still in the physical luxury of this world my duty is to call you to the ultimate sacrifice in the fight for the truth And if you are not willing, I'm sorry, you are in the wrong boat. Get out. Earnestly contend. That's the message. He says that he should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The phrase, ye should earnestly contend, is the translation of a very expressive compound verbal term. In other words, this Greek word is made up of more than one word. And it is epagonizomai. Epagonizomai. Now you can divide that word, epi and agonizomai. Now from the agonizomai, you know, we have the English word agonize. The word contend means agonize. Agonize like what? This word is often used to describe the struggles of a wrestler in overcoming his opponent. In a wrestling match, you know, how two strong fellows go hand to hand to out with the other. And the winner doesn't walk over the other. He doesn't easily turn him over and sit on his top. The winner had to fight, use every bit of his energy to turn the opponent over. Make him fall on his back and celebrate. But it is an agonizing experience. In that process, you get scratched. Well, yesterday Jonathan showed me some of his scratches because he went to Singapore to play rugby. <laughs> so his, his legs had lots of scratches. And that's one of the things that you get. My son, when he was playing rugby, we told him, be very careful, you get injured. He said, no, I want to try. Well, within a month he came back with a twisted angle. And it is the case. 
If you want to be contact sports, if you want to be in contact sports, you have to be ready to pay the ultimate price of getting injured and bearing the agony of it. If you want to be in Christian faith, in the ministry, in being part of the gospel work, you must be ready to agonize. Agonize! This is not a bed of roses. This is not a time to, you know, sit around a dining table and sing and, and uh, you know, clap hands and drink wine and dance. We are in a battle. Don't forget. Sometimes I wonder whether we're in the right place. So cozy, so luxurious. Just now, Reverend Lee Kim Shong told me outside, this is considered a five-star hotel. I said, oh no. How come all the soldiers are in five-star hotel? Should be in some tough terrain. <clears throat> Sit, you know, maybe you should sleep in some tents under the trees, having stones as your pillows. But anyway, I'm not complaining. Thank God for a nice place. I also enjoyed it. Well, so, soldiers also get sometimes nice place. Paul says, I know how to be rich and I know how to be poor. So sometimes we get good trade, praise God. But we, it shouldn't be uh, eternal love for these things. We must be willing to let go all these things for God's glory. God willing, next year, we want to go to Ethiopia. And please don't think we will get such good comfortable place. If you have to sleep five days on the floor, you better do that. Will you go? Like that, pastor, count me out. <laughs> no, I hope it's not the case. You know, we are willing to agonize for the Lord in any situation. And that must be our joy. I'm sure you would do it. You have proven yourself so all these years. And that's why we have, by God's grace, made some progress in the work of the Lord. Let's continue. You know, that's one of the reasons I made sure the theme for the morning devotion will be earnestly contending for the faith. I could have said, following the exact words in the Bible, earnestly contend. I made it contending. Because I don't want you to think that we have never contended. We have been contending based on the command to contend. And we can't now withdraw. We must contend even more. That's my point. We've got to keep on contending. We have fought last year when the issue of verbal plenary preservation of the scripture came. We contended. We stood our ground. But that is not the only battle to come. More to come. Not only that battle, more will come. We got to fight. On and on and on and on. Until the Lord of hosts will call us home. Until our commander in chief says, you have done well, come back. Then we all fall into his mighty hand for eternal rest. Till then, it's our duty to fight. The tense of this verb is present infinity. And that stresses the need to contend for the faith continuously and vigorously. Enthusiasm must be seen in it. You know, we should not be shy about talking about our stand for God's infallible, inerrant word forever. We must be proud about it. Now somebody would twist our stand and say this and that about us. We can, we say, I don't know. You go and ask Pastor Koji. Uh, yeah, he says something, but I like that guy. So even though I don't understand what he says, I just go to his church. Don't be like that. Such a shame. Every one of you should know what we believe and stand by it. Earnestly contend. Remember the words of Paul in 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. In 1 Timothy 6.12 he said, we sang that a while ago. Fight the good fight of faith. You see that? Fight the good fight of faith. Not half-hearted fight. Good fight. We fight well. Second Timothy 4, 7. I have fought a good fight. See, that's what Paul was glad to pass on to the next generation. 
Fight just as I fought a good fight. This, what, this is what I want to say to the next generation of Gethsemanians. Now I believe I am almost in my last lap of ministry. Uh, don't, don't be surprised by that, those words. I'm no more young. More things remind me that I'm closer to my grave. And I hope no one wants to come to this pulpit who doesn't have a spirit to fight for God's truth. I pray that nobody will have the ambition to fill the pulpit of Gethsemane because it has been set up by God's grace and it has been functioning well. It got some resources here and there. So to be a pastor of a well-built church is a, is a you know, wonderful thing to strut around. If that's what you think, please stop on your stride. Don't take any more step. But I pray that there will be young men who will be praying, Lord, make me a warrior, just like Paul, just like Jude, just like all great men who have come. My prayer in my lifetime is that I will fight valiantly like all those who have gone before us. We have many group names that remind us of great men who lived prior to us, including people like Dr. Carl McIntyre, jo Gresham Machen, and even Reverend Timothy told, they have run the race, they have fought their fight, they will never be back here again. You and I must fight now, in our time. Today is our battle. Tomorrow is not ours. If you don't fight now, who will fight? Get some in a BP church. Now I speak to those who are seniors and of my age, those who are about 40. This is our time. And we want to show our children how to earnestly contend for the faith. Holding back nothing. Giving everything to the Lord's work. And I pray to the, to the Lord for the young ones who are listening to me. Youngsters who are below 40, 30, 20 and below. And little ones. That you will rise up. Not as cowards. Not as compromisers but as contenders of the faith. And that must characterize our church. <clears throat> he says that they must earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The faith here refers to the body of truth. In other words, all the sound doctrines of the Bible, everything that God has revealed, it is not about the act of believing that he's talking about, but he's talking about the content of our belief, the faith, the creed, the doctrines that we believe which are revealed in God's word. So take note, he was not calling them to defend their individual faith alone, but the body of truth that was once delivered to the saints. God has delivered to us once and for all this Bible. The word once, hapax in Greek, gives us the idea that the revelation is complete. Once and for all, it is given to the church. And God will preserve it to the end. The word of the Lord endureth for ever. And it is our duty to defend it. It is the duty of the church to know the truth and defend it. And we must, commit, we must be committed to it. So now we must defend it. Firstly, by believing every truth. Secondly, by preaching. And thirdly, living. Or you can change, change the order, believing, living, and preaching the word of God. Now I want to quickly go to the reasons <clears throat> for contending for the faith, which is found in the rest of our verses. Verses 4 to 7. Now in verse 4, we are given the first reason for contending for the faith. 
What is the first reason for contending the faith? Because there are many ungodly men present. Presence of ungodly men. This is how Jude said. For, you must contend because, the word for means because, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There were real reasons for this serious exhortation from Jude that we must earnestly contend for the truth. There are certain men crept unawares. And this truth is not new in the Bible. Jesus have told us that men in sheep clothing, wolves in sheep clothing will come. They are evil. Their fruits will prove to us that they are evil men. They are grievous wolves in the language of Paul in Acts 20. Now here June says, these men will creep unawares. Creep in unawares means unnoticed. Paris de Uo. Paris de Uo means creeping in unnoticed, subtly entering, secretly, without notice, like a thief, they will come. There are all kinds of thieves. There are those who come in the night, unnoticed. But there, there are those who come in daylight. They will come as our friends. They are the worst ones. I remember my maternal grandfather was a very hospitable man. Very hospitable Christian. He loves everybody who calls himself a preacher. And in India there is a habit which is common among some poor Christians, to go from house to house and pray for people and to collect some money after that. So they go from house to house to pray so that they can earn a living. Uh, sometimes, well, they are genuine uh, in praying. They are genuine, but some are wicked men, pretend to be Christians, and they know how to pray. The moment they come to the house, they will say, Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. And start praying. Even before you say anything, they will start praying. And at the end, they will not go away. They will stand there to get some money. There are some guys like that. But anyway, my grandfather was a very kind man. And he sees anybody who he thinks is genuine, he will bring them in and you know, give them food and so on. One day he was about to leave home. And one of such men came. My Grandfather invited him and said, please take a seat. And uh, have you taken your lunch? He said, no. Oh, sorry, it's quite late, isn't it? It's almost two something in the afternoon. So he called my grandma and said, please fix some lunch for this man of God. <laughs> and he said to the so-called preacher, look, I need to go. My wife is here. My children are around. And she will fix the lunch for you, please eat, and then you pray for them and leave. He said, okay, thank you very much. And he started to sit there and sing. You know, sing some familiar hymns. And my grandmother went to the kitchen to cook. When after fi fixing the lunch and she came back, he's no more there. Not only he gone, some other valuable things also gone from the house. Can you imagine that? Now someone will come to the church. I on the on the offerings. Every day check the offering. See, because in our church bulletin there is a section where collection is. Okay, this church is having more and more collection. And the Pastor Koshi get thousand dollars. Denise got hundred dollars. Not bad. A good church to come, get some money. And there are guys like that. I'm not pointing anybody here to be like that, but there are some like that. The moment they get the bulletin, the first part they look is a collection. Forget about the pastoral exhortation. Forget about all other things. Collection! There are people like that. They are not part of the truth and the cause of the gospel.
that would be very dangerous. These people are called ungodly men. You notice that? But before that, he said, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. You know, just because they creep in, do not think God is unaware of them. God has already determined their doom. You know, let nobody here think that they trick God and trick pastor and come in. They make God a fool. No, they don't make God a fool. They just establish the fact that they are condemned people forever. By stealing, by corrupting the church, they do not undo God's plan, but just fall into God's eternal plan. Just as Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ only to fulfill that which God has decreed from foundation of the earth. According to the decrees of God, Judas betrayed Christ. So these men who creep in should not think that they are very clever and they outwit God and the church. No! You, by your evil deed, fall into the eternal condemnation God has decreed for you. So if there is any corruption in any of our heart to abuse the church of Jesus Christ for our material gain, let's fear. Let's fear. No selfish heart should ever put his hand on the work of the Lord. This is a high calling of ultimate sacrifice and eternal devotion to the truth of God. And such men are ungodly men. Asebes. That's the Greek word. Which literally means those who do not worship God properly. Those who have no regard for God's glory. They are godless without fear and reverence of God. Well, their presence make it a necessity. You know what they do? The verse 4 tells us they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. In other words, they say God is gracious. So let's party. Because God is grace, gracious and His grace abound where there is sin. Let's sin. It's okay. It's okay. I hear that Joseph Prince is becoming more and more a preacher of grace. But do you know what they mean by that? Oh, because God is gracious, you can be worldly. Because God is gracious, gr gracious don't let anybody tell you, you must be modest. You must be traditional in your thinking. You have to be more scriptural in everything. God is gracious. Grace gives you freedom. As long as you come back on Sunday and put money into the offering bag and say, Love you, Lord. You shall be in the kingdom of God. But what the Bible says is this. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of God. But for the modern preachers, if you say you must obey the law, you become legalist. If you say that you must abide by the word of God, you are a man who reject grace. Because to them, grace of God allows you to live any way you want at entrance into heaven. This is absolute nonsense, rubbish. That's devil's doctrine. The grace of God frees us from the clutches of sin and protects us from falling into sin again and again and thus be condemned at the end. Grace calls us away from sin. Grace never push you back into sin. Grace of God calls us out of sin. But these men would say, because God is gracious, Let's enjoy our lustful expression. You look at what's going on in many of the mega churches, even in Singapore. Look at what's going on in City Harvest. It's, they call it celebration of worship. It's all about dance and so on. I recently even came back from India 
So some of the pictures in Straits Times, our leading newspaper, about the religious activities of the church, churches in Singapore. So Sedina brought me some paper cuttings of that. And then we have this group of people who took the place that we used in Singapore Post, the heart of God. Oh boy, I saw that, uh, you know, their expression of worship. All these young teenagers in their punky dress, dancing, rapping, all kinds of nonsense. And they call themselves heart of God. What they are doing is this. The grace of God allows you to be as worldly as you want. Do you know, my dear friends, because of this attitude, because of this attitude, in modern churches, fornication is prevalent. Let me tell you, you can be a pastor's son, but still you can sleep with a girl friend, even though you are not married. You will never be disciplined. You will never be disciplined. You can be eldest daughter, sleeping around with boys, before marriage, you will never be disciplined. You can be next day a worship leader in the church. This is what we call turning grace of God into lasciviousness. You can be immodest through and through because you want to catch on to the worldly fashion. Nobody will say anything to you. You can expose more and more of your flesh. And be a temptation. Nobody is going to say anything. God is gracious. Pastor, don't be too strict. This is what modern churches are. They call it contemporary service. Yes, conforming to the world and its fashion. In this process, what they do is this, as Jude says at the end of verse 4, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They deny God, the Lord God. God does not rule in their heart, but the world uh, rule in their heart as the Lord. God is not Lord, the world is Lord. And in this way, they deny the Lord Jesus Christ by very action that they perform. Their attitude, their actions deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, dear friends, there is this notion among many people that I can have Jesus as my Savior. At some point later, I will have Him as my Lord. This is an erroneous doctrine. There are people who say this, you know, I have received the Lord Jesus Christ 10 years ago as my Savior, but He has never been my Lord. Now I take Him as my Lord. That is rubbish. You take him as both Savior and Lord. If you, if you don't do that, he's not your Savior. If What you meant by saying is that, yes, I received the Lord Jesus, but I have not obeyed him, then I understand. But don't preach a doctrine that says, for some years you can have him as Savior, and then later on you take him at your convenience as your Lord. That is impossible. When you say, Lord, I follow you, we are following him absolutely. We follow him the way he walks. It's an absolute surrender. But there are people who deny this, unfortunately. And that's very common in our times. And remember, their presence, their increasing presence in churches around us, in our own denomination, Bible Presbyterian Church, even in our own congregation, must make us wary. When I see long-standing members of our church do not walk right, my heart palpitates. I get nightmares. It's frustrating. Because I don't know where it will lead. 
You know something? Let me share with you a pastoral concern at this time. Let's say some of you live utterly worldly, utterly disinterested in the things of God, and you continue to be a member. You come on Sunday, but live in a worldly way. You know what does it tell the rest of the church? Pastor Koshi would allow you anyway to be such a member. So I also can be the same one. That's enough. This makes me desperate as a pastor. Because there's no what I hope in the Lord to be seen among you. I want to see that all of us together grow in the Lord to maturity, to holiness, to such aspirations as what Jude tells us here. Receiving the grace of God, not to turn into lasciviousness, but to the glory of God through holy living. When that doesn't happen in some corners in the congregation, ah, oh, it's nightmare for me. And so you better think, my dear friend, I come to your side and exhort you this morning. If there is ungodliness of any kind in you, if there is backsliding, lack of devotion in your life, in any form, you could be the one who teach the rest of the church to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. God's grace toward you, another day in your life, another year in your life, is not to take advantage of God's grace to sin or to live in utter rebellion to God but to draw close to you, not to deny his lordship, but to yield. Such men will creep into any church, including ours. The last reason, which I must say very quickly, there are three verses. We don't need too much of explanation, though, though some of those verses are debated so often is this, in these three verses we are told, 5, 6, and 7, the reality of God's wrath. Not only the presence of ungodly men, but the reality of God's wrath. Jude gives us three examples of the reality of God's wrath upon those who rebel against God and His truth. Number one example in verse 5. Here he cites the Israelites who came out of Egypt to go to the promised land. But he says here, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though he once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved them, the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Look at that. He brought out the entire community of the Jews from Egypt, made them cross the Red Sea, brought them to the Sinai Desert, made them walk toward the Promised Land, but before they reached the Promised Land, He just destroyed them. Why? They didn't exercise faith. They rebelled against the Lord and His servant Moses. It is an object lesson before us. This is to remind us. These Jewish Christians have read this story so many times. So here Jude says, remember this. Don't perish like your ancestors who perished in wilderness. You have come to get some in a BP church. You sing the songs of redemption. You sing psalms. You hear the gospel preaching. You sit there week after week for hours to hear the preacher preaching. You read the magazines, you read the articles, you come for the camp, but if it all will end in your destruction, what's the use? This is no myth. This is reality before which we should tremble. God did that. If that example is not enough, listen to another one. God doesn't care who you are. Even though you are an angel, if you dare to challenge the truth of God, your destiny will be this. That's the next message. Look at verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, 
He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Well, some people like to use these words to say, oh, the angels who did not keep their first estate left their own habitation. It's a reference to angels who came down to have sexual relationship with women of this world. And they refer to Genesis chapter 6, where sons of, men, sons of God ha having relationship with daughters of men. Well, we know in the Bible, Jesus said that angels cannot have marital relationship because they are spirit beings. So I don't buy that. I don't believe that angels ever had sexual relationship with human beings. That's not the way God has created them. Now they can't take on a, a state that God has not created them with. I can never become an angel, even if I'm rebellious. Angels cannot become a man in every sense, unless God give it to them. So they are not created that way. That's not the point. They did rebel. We know Lucifer rebelled from Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And with him, a group of angels also fell. Now we are not given all the reasons, but it's sufficient here to notice this. A group of angels rebelled and because of their rebellion, God has reserved them in chains under darkness, under the day of judgment. So whether you are the people of Israel or even angels who are created to serve God, if you ever dare to go against the truth of God's word and overstep the boundaries that God has set for you, you will be judged. Judgment is a reality. Nobody will escape it. And he gives one more example in the next verse. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, one of the richest cities, in the ancient world to which Lot and his family ran for a wonderful life. <laughs> but Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You know the people in Sodom and Gomorrah were very sexually immoral people. If you use the word sodomite upon somebody, it means a person is a gay, a homosexual. Sodomites were homosexuals. That's why when the angels came to visit Lot to tell him to get out of that city, they saw the people of Sodom and Gomorrah saw these two men who came to visit Lot were extremely handsome, good to look at. They came looking for these two men. Lord said, I will give you my daughters, unmarried daughters. You take them if, they, if you need them, but don't, not these two visitors. They said, no, 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 no. We want these men. They were so corrupt to the core of their heart. They were given to fornication and they went after strange flesh. Now what is strange flesh? Well, some commentators think it is going after the angels. But then angels are not flesh, strange flesh. It might mean that, but I think it also refers to bestiality. Bestiality. People having sexual relationship with animals. It's a thing that is condemned in the Bible. They were so, so corrupt, so wicked in the mind. Now we are not too far from this kind of degeneration. Homosexuality is a common thing nowadays. Recently one man wrote to me to see whether uh, what's my position on homosexuality. I said you'll read my articles in my church website. And then he sent me a video clip of a Baptist church in the United States that um, in a way I think extreme goes out to uh, condemn homosexuality now their hatred toward homosexuality 
is something that I agree with. In other words, they don't like homosexuality. But I think we cannot go to the extreme that we don't even want to give the gospel to them. We must preach the gospel to them. We must love them in God. We don't love their sin. But we must lovingly present the gospel. Nonetheless, they send uh, some of these video clips of that church and ask me whether I agree with them. I didn't reply to them. Because if I say I agree with them, they will come after me. If I say I don't agree with them, they will say I, I am pro-homosexual. <laughs> so I don't want to do anything. I said, you go and read and listen to my messages. That's all. Now they are now after pastors to see whether they are pro or anti-homosexuals. Can you imagine that? And many pastors today find it a stylish thing to tell the world, we love homosexuals. Gays are welcome. You can be a member of the church. And some go even to the extent of ordaining them to be pastors, bishops, and so on. We are living in a time such as that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Destruction will come very quick. Just like what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Vengeance of eternal fire is coming. Dear friends, is there any reason why you wouldn't rise up to defend the faith? Is there any reason in your heart against this wonderful message that Jude has given to me? Let me close right here, taking no more time by saying this. If we do not earnestly contend for the faith, we will quickly die as the church of Christ. One way to destroy Gethsemane BP Church is to stop fighting for the truth. Every Christian who is not a fighter for the truth is a dying man. No hope for you. Condemnation of God awaits. We do not want to be trapped in that scenario. Let's turn to the Lord and seek His grace to revive and renew our heart to fight a good fight of faith.